All righty. So I think we can get started now uh, with the presentation. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, so today we're going to be having a presentation on building the garden, advocating for discretionary funding. So talking a little bit about um, what discretionary funding is, um, different types of discretionary funding, timelines, um, how to advocate for it. Um, so we'll have great panelists that are joining us. You can see them right now on the screen, so I'll introduce them. Uh, my name is Cynthia, I will be helping moderate, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator. I'm the whole support gardens in Manhattan's Community Boards 10 and 11. So that's um, uh, East and Central Harlem. And NYC Parks Green Thumb is the part of the Parks Department that helps support um, all 550 gardens um, in New York City. So throughout all five boroughs. Um, also joining us today as a panelist is Matt Drury. He's the Chief of Citywide Legis uh, Legislative Affairs for NYC Parks. Uh, Sarah McCollum Williams, who's Executive Director of Green Gorillas, and Robert Atterbury, um, who is Executive Vice President of Parks Relationships and Programs at the Hudson River Park Trust, um, and who's also done, as a gardener, also done advocacy around uh, funding for, for community gardens. So a lot of um, experience with that. So I'll just briefly go a little bit about how this workshop is going to go, the agenda for today. Uh, we're doing introductions. If you haven't already, please feel free to um, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, so uh, if you're coming with the garden, what garden you're from, what borough you might be in. Um, if you're not with the garden, that's fine. You can also put, you know, why you're here. Maybe you're you're here just, you know, as an interest resident who wants to do advocacy um, for community projects. So... Then we'll go into our panel discussion. So um, all panelists will talk about different kind of facets of this advocacy. Um, and then we're going to Q&A. So for questions and answers, please, um, any questions that come up, put them in the chat and we'll uh, read them a lot at the end. Um, a colleague Adder will also be, you know, monitoring the chat. So if there's any clarifications that, you know, should happen sooner, they can clarify in the chat. But um, but please uh, just know that those, those questions will be answered at the end. And alrighty, so we are getting started with the presentation. Um, so what is discretionary funding? Uh, discretionary funding uh, is funding from elected officials that can be given towards either city agencies or eligible nonprofits for community projects. And we have two different types of kind of uh, grouping of funding. Uh, we have capital funding, so these are projects that cost greater than $50,000 and represent a comprehensive betterment of, you know, of, of that space for the community. So, um, and like uh, the project will be in place for more than, and the project will be in place for more than five years. So what is a comprehensive betterment? Um, you know, we see here where it says nuance, uh, one single bench, you know, would not be a comprehensive betterment, a single bench that costs $50,000. But redesigning a sitting area with, you know, multiple benches and, and beautifying it, that's a project that could potentially, uh, that is a comprehensive betterment and that could amount to $50,000, right? So that's that's what comprehensive betterment means. Um, examples of capital projects that have been done in the past are fence installations, um, on-site water installation, sidewalk reconstruction. Um, and this type of funding can only be given to city agencies. So uh, for example, NYC parks that we would then help um, the garden uh, with those funds. Um, and then we have another type of funding. This is expense funding. And this is 5,000. So a project that would be 5,000 to $50,000. Um, examples of this are garden supplies, tools, compost bins, benches, lumber for specialty projects. Um, so, you know, it's still helping out the garden and, and the garden's purpose, but not necessarily this a very huge undertaking and, and redesigning of the space. 
Um, this type of funding can go to city agencies or eligible nonprofits who can then front the money and get reimbursed. Um, and the words are specific to a fiscal year. So the fiscal year is July 1st to June 30th. Uh, and it must be used within that time frame. So it, it does have like a like a deadline for the for the amounts to be used. And so I'll pass it on now to uh to Matthew and he can talk uh about different types of capital projects and, and funding streams. For sure. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And uh, my name is Matt Drury. I'm the uh, chief of citywide legislative affairs uh, for the New York City Parks Department. So I work really closely uh, with the Green Fund team where we're in the same sort of group division of community outreach and partnership development. So we're division mates. And uh, so we work really closely. Uh, so thank uh, thank to uh, all the garden groups and, and, and advocates for, for joining today's uh, meetings. Uh, you know, this has been one in a series of conversations that we've had with our, you know, with our garden members and other, you know, park advocates, you know, to try to help equip all of you with the tools to kind of, you know, uh, you know, we all want to make our, our parks and gardens better places. So thank you all for your your dedication and, and all the all that you do. Um, so with that said, just really quickly, uh, the capital outline uh, that Cynthia provided was really helpful. But if it's if it's, uh, I'll add a, just a, 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 a capital in terms of capital eligibility. If I can provide a, maybe a, a framework. It usually involves construction equipment, like it is sort of very, you know, it is usually substantial. It usually involves what they call earthworks, right? Like there's digging and it, there's, you know, sometimes like large, you know, heavy construction equipment, people wearing hard hats, right? Like that's generally capital, capitally eligible work, you know, as opposed to just painting a surface or, you know, fixing a bench slat or something like that, uh, you know, for, for maybe a, a decent example you know, replacing uh, the backboards or nets on a basketball uh, court are not, that is not capital eligible, but reconstructing the court, you know, resurfacing, you know, digging, re, you know, re-leveling, dealing with drainage, and then and then rebuilding the court, that's you know, that's very obviously uh, capital eligible. So that to give you a sense of that, that framework. Anyhow, so there are lots of great capital eligible uh, improvements that can be made at gardens. Uh, fencing is a big one. Uh, we have, you know, obviously hundreds of gardens throughout the system. And, um, you know, so and there have been some really great uh, fencing improvements that have helped provide, you know, better access, you know, that this can often include, you know, um, making things, you know, more accessible in terms of, uh, you know, ADA standards and things of that nature can be really helpful. Uh, we can hop to the next slide, I think. Uh, and water service is another big uh, addition, you know, so many of uh, obviously right now the gardens uh you know many cases are drawing water from a nearby hydrant with a permit from DEP and that's you know obviously that's you know that's that's important uh but we you know wherever possible we try to try to seek uh support for additional uh water service installation so that's another great capitally eligible um project and here's a here's an example there in Manhattan and then uh lastly sidewalks uh you know it is no secret uh we're all New Yorkers here you know uh the sidewalks of New York City are in varying degrees of condition uh it can be you know especially with snow and and things like that you know, you know uh, it can be a challenge uh since it's adjacent to a city property you know obviously it's it's you know adjacent you know for parks uh gardens you know we have an, you know the garden group generally speaking takes on the responsibility to sort of keep the sidewalk you know clean and maintained raked you know shoveled what have you uh the agency does its best to support where we can but when it comes to repairing or you know resurfacing and re you know, uh, rebuilding uh, sidewalks that that border a garden, that's something that I think can be that's that is also capital eligible work. Uh, that can be a really great uh, uh, project to pursue as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's uh, so we talked a little bit about what you can do with the money. Let's talk a little bit about how we can get the money. Um, so the Parks Department uh, has a massive. Uh, I don't mind saying uh, um, capital budget. Uh, they, we have uh, hundreds of capital projects underway at any given time, upwards of 600 or so that are in one you know uh, phase or another. And a, a large variety of these projects are funded by the mayoral administration, by the agency directly. Uh, those are funded through conversations with the mayor's office of management and budget. But uh, those are usually done in uh, pretty huge swaths and they uh, tend to focus on what you might call infrastructure, sort of core infrastructure. So replacing boilers in our, you know, rec center facilities or uh, replacing retaining walls that run along, you know, many of our, you know, park, you know, that which have some of which have, you know, elevated uh, grade changes, you know, sort of really sort of technical 
you know, important, but, you know, uh, not as flashy, uh, the, a lot of those projects. Uh, so for site specific projects or park specific garden specific projects, we often rely on support from our elected officials who can provide significant uh, discretionary funding. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about uh, those streams. And they kind of come to uh, two chunks, capital, which we kind of just talked about eligibility. And then there is some access to uh, non-capital, which people generally refer to as expense funding. Uh, but we'll talk about the capital funding first. Um, and from the city's perspective, the the main uh, sources for, for discretionary funding on the, on the city front are our borough presidents. So each of the, the five boroughs has a borough president and they have access to it varies a little bit because of the population of the boroughs shifts, uh, but so, but it's give or take, uh, they have access to roughly $20 million a year that they can make available to city agencies, you know, and again, this is everything all over the city. So schools, uh, um, all the competing needs that are out there for, you know, DOT doing repairs, uh, uh, libraries, what have you, right? Like all the city capital improvement needs that are, that are out there. You know, so that so the borough presidents have access to some funding that they can designate on an annual basis, um, and and parks I think has done a pretty good job at working with the VPs to funnel their support in a variety in a variety of ways, and then the city council members. There are fifty one council members uh, throughout the city, and they get access to a chunk of discretionary capital funding as well. My understanding is it's somewhere in the ballpark of five or six million a year. Again, to be clear, like that has to be spread amongst different needs. They may have multiple entities reaching out to them for support. And so, you know, uh, I think we often hear from council members that their money doesn't go as far as they'd like, right? Like they're trying to satisfy a lot of people. They're in the business of making people happy for obvious reasons. Uh, they're, they're trying to help their constituents and it can be a challenge, I know, for them to kind of uh, allocate this, uh, you know, as evenly as possible. Although Parks does its best to communicate with them and make sure they know what our priorities are, what we see as the most pressing matters, uh, park related matters in their district. Um, I will note specifically out of that five or 6 million, about 30, about two thirds of the council, give or take uh, several of the members, they undergo an exercise uh, called participatory budgeting, which is where they dedicate a portion of their allocation uh, and they put it through sort of a public facing exercise. And that's actually underway right now uh, they recruit PB, uh, it's short, uh, particip participatory budgeting, we do, people call it PB for short. So they recruit PB delegates who are just local citizens, uh, folks who are just involved in their community to kind of help shape. Uh, and then in those districts, they actually put out a public ballot. I think there's both online voting and, and, and in-person voting in many cases. And there's an exercise that is, you know, just getting started now, will carry out through the spring. And then there'll be, they actually, you know, it's a little bit like, I don't know, American Idol of the Mass Singer, right? Like people kind of like vote for winning projects and the council member essentially pledges to fund those projects. Um, so it's an, it's, so it's, the, it's all part of the same pool of funding, but it's sort of an interesting mechanism uh, that includes and incorporates public uh, input and direct democracy, which is a really interesting exercise. Uh, and the agency cooperates with the council and helps give them information and to, you know, to help them shape up their ballots. Um, but again, this is all sort of in terms of competing interests. There are school related projects, you know, they, they could use a new, you know, a new cafeteria in their local school or a new computer center or a new gym, what have you, or a you know, library needs upgrades, right? Like in parks are kind of in that same universe uh, in terms of funding projects, uh, projects that can be funded. So that's the capital chunk of discretionary funding uh, from our city electeds. The city council specifically, not the borough presidents, but the city council, additionally have access to a smaller but but much more flexible um, chunk of funding. Uh, it varies pretty widely because uh, the council includes um, you know poverty statistics and other demographic uh, socioeconomic data in making these allocations, but it's it's roughly half a million bucks uh, per council member, give or take. Uh, in expense funding. So these are, these are, so everything we talked about with capital eligibility, you know, like, like replacing a backboard, for example, would not be capital eligible, but this is something where if there is a sort of smaller targeted improvement, even if it's not capital eligible, you know, we could take advantage of a council member's discretionary expense funding on this side. And so, um, so they, you know, we engage with the council members on an ongoing basis to try to, you know, pitch them on funding ideas of sort of smaller targeted improvements. And it is certainly possible that there might be some uh, garden improvements, you know, for a specific garden that aren't capitally eligible, but might fit the bill for a council member's um, discretionary expense funding. Uh, and, and specifically the council uh, a couple of years ago introduced a, a, a specific funding initiative, which is thematically dedicated uh, to improving parks and open space. It's called the Parks Equity Initiative. And so it is part of that larger pool of funding they have, but it is uh, dedicated towards 
park or open space improvements. It doesn't necessarily have to be routed to the agency. Uh, this funding uh, can also be uh, routed to registered 501c3 uh, nonprofits. And I know uh, Sarah, and I, you know, as, as part of Green Gorillas, has gone through the funding process. Isn't exactly the easiest to navigate, but she'll I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. But it is there. I know the funding. A lot of uh, really great uh, nonprofit groups have relied on the funding and and been able to provide amazing services and, and programming uh, with the council support there. So which we are obviously happy to to champion and, and help support as well. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Matt. So I'll take it from here for this slide. Um, okay, so you've heard of this money now and you're like, how do I get this money, right? So we can talk a little bit about the process and timeline of how um, garden groups can advocate to receive some of this money for any projects that you're doing um, in your garden. So I highly encourage you if you're considering to um, advocate or apply for some of this money is to meet with your CEC first. Um, so to want to discuss, you know, keep them aware of, uh, of plants in the garden to to be able to brainstorm like different ways to to get the funding um, and also how to like kind of guide you through this process as well. Um, so meet with your CC. Also, Green Thumb also does our own like internal advocacy um, for for funding. So we want to make sure that, you know, whatever advocacy we're doing actually supports whatever needs um, and plans that gardens have. Um, so let your CC know. Um, uh, we're more than happy to meet with you all and, and brainstorm and come up with a plan of attack with you all on this. Um, next, uh, during the fall and winter is when you, I mean, during the fall and winter, but it really is ongoing, um, you are advocate with um, your elected uh, official with like local representatives. So uh, garden, garden groups um, can reach out to local representatives, um, start talking to them about asking them for funds uh, to fund whatever project you have in mind, uh, whether it's fencing, whether it's water insulation, um, and yeah, and 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 start like setting up that relationship and talking to them about your plans, um, for the for the need for this uh, discretionary funding, um, and then afterwards in June or July, that's when the budget gets announced. So that's when, you know, you find out whether or not. Uh, the gardens receive like specific funding awards. Uh, sorry, that's when, when the budget gets announced, but then um, specific funding awards may not be released until the following January or February. So um, budget gets allocated in June and July, but we might not be funding out till January or February. Um, next. Uh, and so this is the overall discretionary process and timeline for nonprofits. Uh, so, the first is meeting with your rep. So meet with staff from council member or borough president offices. Um, the deadline to apply is mid February twenty twenty four. Generally, I'm not sure if um it's been announced already for this year. We're kind of getting close to mid February, but um that's when nonprofits uh would apply, so, and then um awards then get announced in June or July. So this is for again for nonprofits like. For example, Green Gorillas. Next, and then passing it back to Matt. Yeah, I can talk a, a little bit about the the agency. This is the city's sort of capital project uh, process. So, regarding again, this capital funding usually is allocated towards you know what you might call like substantial construction like rebuild you know there's usually some diggers and you know construction uh contractors etc so these are usually more substantial projects um so i will talk a little bit about our you know it's the the city's general process um which can range from you know the rebuilding of a seating like a triangle seating area to you know an entire you know a pool reconstruction like you know rec center project uh but this so these are very broad strokes but so i'll talk a little bit about the capital process um Firstly, we have what we call our project initiation. This is when our capital team kind of, you know, make sure that we have the funding that we need in hand. Uh, they assign design staff uh, and they start to engage with the public about how we want to, you know, uh, any specific changes that are needed there. So if we're doing a full reconstruction of a playground, for example, we quite often hold a community input session where people can come and kind of opine about, you know, how they use the park, what's mo what features are most valuable to them, what do they want to see, you know the shape, how you get in, get out of, like sort of, it's a, it's a very sort of fulsome, uh, comprehensive 
uh, discussion regarding, uh, you know, and if it's a more targeted uh, project that's a little smaller in scale, you know, the conversation might not be that robust. You know, if you're rebuilding a basketball court, you know, it's pretty straightforward, right? So, uh, but, but if, you know, if there were to be a capital project taking place in a specific garden, by all means, obviously, we would, we would engage really closely with that garden group to make sure that the project serves, you know, what, you know, probably you know, in hopes that it solves problems that they're seeking to solve, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we enter into the design process, which is uh, pretty considerable. It's not as simple as, you know, just sketching something out on a piece of paper. It is a, uh, a you know, most of these projects are really technical from an engineering standpoint. Uh, again, there is usually sort of earthworks and, uh, uh, you know, drainage and a lot of really technical sort of engineering and, and uh, architectural kind of issues that need to be solved. Um, you know, so in addition to the design, that also includes going through the city's design approval process which usually involves uh, engagement with uh, the local community board. They, they, you know, they're usually apprised of these projects and they, they get, they have advisory uh, uh, approval uh, role there as well as the public design commission uh, that, which is the city's sort of uh, artistic referee for lack of a better term uh, or the landmark marks uh, uh, division, which the uh, commission, excuse me, which, you know, for certain properties and, you know, not very many in the garden world, I don't believe, but, uh, but have, have a role to play there as well. And then also just, you know, various permits that need to be obtained, you know, that's all sort of part of the design process. So it can take upwards of a year, give or take, uh, sometimes a little more. And then, you know, again, these are usually con substantial con uh, construction projects. Uh, the city doesn't really have construction workers on payroll, like it's this, you know, little known fact. Like when you see sort of a city project happening, it's paid for, you know, through tax dollars and all that, but, the, but it is actually outsourced to an independent construction contractor to actually do the, you know, the actual work on the ground. And those projects are assigned through the procurement process, which is a very tightly managed, uh, it's the city's, you know, uh, so you have to qualify as a contractor to do business with the city. It's a very, you know, it's very complicated to ensure that, you know, contracts aren't being awarded inappropriately or, or what have you. Uh, so there are some really, uh, you know, so the uh, comptroller's office, uh, the, the mayor's office of contract services, there's a, a whole universe of uh, rules and regulations regarding how these projects get put out to bid. But the, the long story short is that, you know, from Parks' perspective, it is essentially a, uh, it's an open bid process where, you know, it's a competitive sealed bid, bid and, and, and the, you know, so there's a review of these bids and essentially the, the agency is compelled to accept the, uh, the lowest uh, bid, you know, the most cost-effective bid from the uh, from the from a responsible responsive bidder, right? So there's all these sort of uh, rules attached to that. But anyhow, so that that you know that involves a lot of legal reviews and uh, you know obviously advertising the bids and and all and and uh, you know reviewing the responses. That's a very time consuming process as well. That can take you know nine to, to nine months or upwards of a year. Uh, and then the construction itself. This can vary widely, uh, obviously depending on the complexity of the project, how big. You know, but uh, even smaller projects, you know, it's it's uh, you know pretty striking how long it, you know construction just can take a long time in New York City. That is just the reality. And then when you account for things like weather, you know, cold weather delays, it's very hard to do any sort of ground moving or uh, digging. You know, in the winter months, for example, just because you know because the, the, uh, the you know the, the surface gets too cold. Anyway, there's all these sort of things that can start to kind of you know monk so. When you add it all together, it, you know, even for a, a fairly modest project, it can take uh, upwards of three or more years to see it through from, you know, from alpha to omega. And that, you know, I think a lot of people are struck by that, you know, but, but uh, you know, because uh, we all think of sort of construction just when you see, you know, the hard hats and the construction fencing. But the, as you can tell from this grid, uh, there's a lot that kind of, you know, uh, leads up to the the construction itself. But and uh, it's, a, it's a complicated process for sure. And uh, so... The garden processes, uh, you know, in terms of fencing or sidewalk repair or water installation, you know, I think there have been some advantages, you know, because it is smaller, it's a little more scaled down, uh, you know, construction's not quite as complicated. So I think we've been able to advance a lot of garden projects on a, on a faster pace, for sure. But uh, the flip side is that it can be harder to recruit uh, construction companies to bid for smaller projects that, you know, they're all out there building, I don't know, mega residential towers or whatever. So sometimes, you know, a smaller, more modest project doesn't attract as much attention uh, from, from your established uh, experienced construction companies. And so it's a little bit of a, a uh, little bit of a balancing act that we, that we strike, but that's, that's sort of the city's capital process in a nutshell. Thank you, Matt. So I'll quickly go over um, a few resources that might help you um, as you get started with this advocacy for this funding. Um, if you don't know 
what community board you or your gardener your garden is in. Um, you can go to this link right here. Um, and the following here to figure out like who your city council member is. Um, again, your borough president. Um, your elect, uh, state elected officials, your federal elected officials. Um, and if you don't know who your community average coordinator is, we also um, have them listed on our website. Um, and like I said, we're all, please reach out to your coordinator and we're more than happy to help you all through this process. Um, I'm gonna pass it now to uh, Sarah from Green Gorillas and she'll be talking a little bit more about the process uh, for expense funding um, and nonprofits and, and what that looks like. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Um, thanks for your time. I'm gonna share my screen and get started. Go back to the beginning. Sorry, I started in the wrong place here. Okay, um, so Green Gorillas, like Cynthia mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around for 50 years now, um, and we exist to support community gardens. Um, and that support takes a lot of different shapes. One of the things that we do um, as part of that support is reach out to city council members and apply for discretionary funds um, in the different districts where we, um, where we work and where we want to supplement our work further. Um, I wanted to just quickly kind of touch on some of our values and the focus areas that we have and kind of then how that um, leads into the rest of our work. So some of the things that we value our core values are um, community land use and access, food sovereignty, climate justice, and an exchange of wisdom and about food, nature, and land between generations. So we are interested in kind of helping to foster relationships between gardeners um, and youth, and also in economic initiatives rooted in community action and service and health. Um, and then that translates into the areas that we focus on, which is connecting gardeners with resources, which um, this discretionary funding conversation ties into empowering youth, building coalitions and advocating for gardens, which is also connected to this conversation today as well. Um, and, and so I wanted to just share a couple of examples, um, you know, of different um applications that we've submitted and different um, ways that we've used discretionary funding. Um, and this is just the example from um, our current fiscal year. So during this fiscal year, which started um, Jan uh, July 1st, uh, 2023 and runs through June 30th um, of this year, 2024, um, Green Gorillas applied for and was awarded the following funds in the districts that are highlighted here. So we have funds and we have, you can see it's a pretty big um, array of different award amounts. Some are pretty modest, um, like uh, in Council District 2 from Carlina Rivera, we have $10,000 awarded, but there are like 42 community gardens in Council District 2. So that doesn't necessarily translate into a ton of projects that we can do um, versus, for example, Diana Ayala or Chio Se, um, who are supporting, you know, um, at different levels there that allow us to do a lot more within their particular districts. Um, and we applied through these funds through, um, I believe Cynthia mentioned the yearly discretionary funding application process that um, is open to nonprofit organizations. Um, and that funding deadline is coming up really soon. I forget the exact date. I just submitted our application, so I don't remember the, but it might be the 15th or the 20th. It's coming very soon. Um, so just to share a couple of highlights of some of the things that we've been able to do and projects we've been able to support using discretionary funds. Um, and, and we kind of 
the way that we um, sort of decide how to use the funds when a council member grants us the funds is kind of a multifaceted way. So we talk with the council member's office. We reach out to community garden groups in the district um, and share uh, like a needs assessment with them to try to understand what are the most pressing needs um, or what are sort of general support needs that are happening. We talk with folks at Green Thumb and say, hey, in the areas that you're working in, what are some needs that are surfacing? And then we sort of synthesize all of those different inputs um, it, as we're figuring out how to go about spending the funds. Um, and so, you know, this is an example where for the 11th Street Community Garden, we were able to purchase um, some different supplies to help rebuild a seating area that got damaged when a tree came down during a storm. Um, we're able to support with different community events. This is something that sometimes Green Thumb um, because of the like purchasing supply limitations, they're not necessarily able to help with a lot of event supplies. So we love to help in the districts where we have discretionary funding. We love to help groups um, with supplies for, for their community events. So this is an example of an Earth Day event and we were able to you know, provide a lot of different supplies to assist that garden. This is the Heidi Carthen Community Garden in bed -Stuy. Um, to be able to support that event um, and to even help build smaller areas within a garden. This is also the Heidi Carthen Community Garden. This is a small children's area within the garden um, that doesn't rise up to the level of a capital project. It doesn't take $50,000 to do, but it, it does take a little bit more than you know, the garden has has access to in and of themselves. So we're able to work with the garden group and work with the city council member's office to open up the discretionary funds that we were granted in order to um, work with the garden and supply the things that they needed for this particular area in the garden. Um, and then purchasing other types of, you know, supplies. We've been purchasing these metal raised garden beds. Um, a little greenhouse kits, some of the other things that we can purchase that maybe Green Thumb can't purchase. You know, another example of that is um, like books for the children's garden area. This is for La Isla. Um, and, you know, um, I think I got get into a couple other, oh, plants. We do plant distributions and seed, uh, supply seedlings and seeds. Um, and then also, this is another form of event support where this is from uh, Padre Plaza um, Success Garden in Mott Haven. They do this like winter wonderland event every year. They distribute hats and gloves and a to they give away one toy each. They typically um, bring in about 300 kids from the neighborhood for this event. It's extremely pop popular and it's a wonderful way for the community to spend time in the garden, get to know the garden, and you know, also use have the garden operate as a resource center and a gathering place for community. We love to be able to support things like that. And we can use, in this case, discretionary funds from uh, Deputy Speaker Diane Ayala to support those sorts of things. Um, and then sometimes we can do like deeper engagements. This is, um, and we probably should have tried to do a capital campaign for this. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you've heard the story of this crazy way that we did this fencing project, but this is at La Finca del Sur, um, which is in the South Bronx. And they were having, they have a complicated land use and um, the land, the way the land is separated there, the ownership of it is complicated. So it's, it's sort of on this triangle between the Major Deegan and the Metro North. And part of the land is owned by the MTA and part of the land is owned by the Parks Department. But then of course, they also have to consult with and consider what's happening with the Metro North um, hillside as well. And so even though there was a beautiful green thumb supplied fence um, at the front of the garden, the back of the garden was completely unfenced and people were coming down 
from the highway or from the tracks on Metro North and just, you know, completely gutting the garden of supplies. There was a lot of theft that was going on. Um, and it was just a problem that had lasted for a really long time. And because of the fact that the land itself was shared between these different entities, sort of each agency was saying to the other agency, well, this isn't my problem, this is your problem. No, wait, that's not my problem, it's your problem. And there was a lot of like talking at cross purposes. Nobody was sort of willing to actually get a fence up in the back of that property and help to really adjust, you know, address this problem in a long-term way. So since we're operating outside of the city government, we were able to work in conjunction with the council member's office and with the garden group, and then ultimately with Metro North, MTA, and parks to be able to use discretionary funds to do this fencing project in multiple phases. Um, and so we did phase one, we did phase two, and then the parks department um, has now committed to do phase three, which would be to fence just the portion that is on parks property. So, um, so sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's as simple as, you know, um, supplying um, things for a community event. Other times it's something more complicated, like a garden group is really having a sort of intractable problem and how can we assist to help solve? Um, so this is all to say that nonprofits like Green Gorillas can access funds to benefit garden groups. Um, and, you know, that's because, you know, there are a number of factors that are involved in this. One is that it takes a certain amount of staff capacity for just securing and administering the funding. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, there's a very, since these are all funds that are given on a reimbursement basis, we have to put up the funds up front and then we have to wait for a period of time afterwards for the city to reimburse us. Sometimes that period of time is as long as a year or 18 months after we've spent the funds. So we have to wait for a long time uh, for those funds to come back to us. And we have to submit, in some cases, multiple hundreds of pages of reimbursement packet with all the details of every single transaction. So it, it does take a lot of time to just administer the funding. Um, and then also takes relationships across networks, um, you know, being able to work with a city council member um, and go to them and talk about the needs of their garden group of garden groups across their whole district, as opposed to just the needs of one particular group, you know, being able to share from a broader perspective can sometimes be uh, compelling for a council member. And then of course, maintaining you know, that ongoing outreach and relationship building with elected officials can also help build visibility and support for funding needs. So for example, when we finished the phase one of the project that we did for the fencing um, at La Finca del Sur, we invited Deputy Speaker Ayala to speak at the dedication of that fence and acknowledged and thanked her for that and you know, continued to acknowledge and thank Electeds invite them to events and just maintain that sort of relationship with them. Um, some tips about pitching projects to Electeds. And I think Robert will go into this, so I don't want to go too heavy into this, but just the importance of setting the context, calling and emailing your council member's office to request a meeting, letting them know you're a constituent, talking with them about how long your garden has been serving the district, what types of things your garden does that serve the district, define the project, be succinct about what the need is, what the project is, what, what issue does it address, what resources do you need, and then share the impact. Why is this important? Uh, how is this gonna impact not only the garden group, but also the neighbors, the broader neighborhood around the garden. Um, and you're also welcome uh, to reach out to us. If it's possible for us, we're happy to share meeting time with electeds um, or resources or in make introductions and include your garden needs when we make requests to electeds. 
Um, we're in the mode of that right now. So um, that's, and it's always a good time. There's never a bad time. You know, if, if a need pops up in, you know, a time that's not right in the middle of the budget season, we're not shy to go and voice that to one of the council members. And, and typically, you know, they're able to do something um, or at least say we can help next year or something like that. Um, and then also I want to just invite you all to some upcoming advocacy trainings and meetings that we have happening. Um, since the city is in the midst of a fiscal crisis, we think it's a really important year to be really active in advocating for the needs of community gardens specifically to address gardeners needs um, to articulate budget priorities for community gardens to be able to ensure their growth and sustainability so we have some meetings coming up on the 17th and on the 24th and then we have a two-day um, advocacy training that's happening that's called empowering community gardens building your advocacy toolbox i that's not but if you're interested in that and you put your name in the chat, I can make sure you get the invitation to that. I will share a link to register in the chat for the meetings and you can pay attention to what's happening with this events link as well um, as we're really gearing up to do a really strong advocacy push and conversation about what the needs are, why it's essential for uh, council members across the city to be funding community gardens and to be um, making sure that within the budget um, that that is reflected as a, as a, as a key priority. Um, then there are also some other funding sources um, that are, are open and available right now that your group can apply directly for. Um, the City Parks Foundation just in the past couple of days announced that they they have a new round open for their NYC Green Fund grassroots grant program. I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Um, and that is funding support from anywhere between $1,000 to $40,000 um, for a year, depending on the size of the group, the size of the need and the request, et cetera. So I'll put a link to that because that's, an, that's a way in which um, your garden group does not have to be a 501c3 in order to apply for this, unlike the discretionary funds. For the discretionary funds through the city council, your group has to be a 501c3 in order to fill out your own application. You can advocate for funds, you can work with a nonprofit to get funds to support your garden group, but your garden group in and of itself can't apply for those funds unless you are a 501c3, which some garden groups are. But this particular other funding source through City Parks Foundation, you don't have to be a 501c3 in order to apply for. The application is open now. So I'll share a link to that as well um, in the chat. And I just wanted to also take a moment to thank all of you for your incredibly vital work. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over back over to Cynthia. Hi, everyone. So we have one last panelist, uh, Robert Atterbury, Executive Vice President of Arts Relationships and Programs at Hudson River Park Trust. So I'll pass it to you, Robert. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I know we're running short on time, uh, so I will try to be uh, quick and to the point. Um, I think folks all the folks before me have talked a lot about of uh, the technical information um and the various definitions of things and all of that um and my uh, first message that i want to give to everyone is it is absolutely possible for you to get a major capital investment in your garden um i was uh one of the founders of hooper grove um in uh williamsburg um we worked for a number of years and we got our garden and we had a collapsing old um, fence, um, chain link fence that was there from when it was a previous lot for decades, what have you, when the city wouldn't take care of it. Um, and we worked with our local council member and they, uh, we got uh, funding and the city came and replaced our fence. Um, they worked with us on the design, they built a curb 
because f- trash was coming in under the fence. So they built a six inch curb and then put a four foot fence on it and gave us two gates and installed on site water, which for our garden was transformative to so no longer have to use a hydrant um, and replaced the sidewalk, which was collapsing and the tiles were all mismatched on the outside uh, all along it. We are a corner lot. So we had 125 feet and the corner uh, to shovel and to have those level and be able to just run a shovel across them really made our lives much easier. It is absolutely possible. Um, so don't get discouraged. Um, I know the timeline seems long. Uh, it did take us, I will say, um, from when our council member allocated the money to when the project was done. It was about three and a half years. Um, it was disruptive to tear up the edge of the garden, put in a thing. But, but now it is beautiful and it is like makes us much more a part of the neighborhood where we are less walled off. We don't have an eight foot high collapsing chain link fence around us. We have real gates that we can secure. Um, We have the water on site, which allows us to like actually really water without having to haul the hose out to the street and open a hydrant every time. So it is feasible Um, and don't be discouraged. And I think this is one for it. Um, Matt said it, uh, and Sarah said it a little bit too. The pot of money that you are applying for to your council member, that you're asking them to send to your garden, is the same pot of money that they are sending to replace school bathrooms or upgrade the lunch counter at a senior center or do a million other really good projects um, in your district that serve your neighbors. Um, and so it's going to take a little while um, to for you to get it through. Most projects have to apply a couple of times at least um, to to their council member to help them understand the need and to, and help them decide to send the money your way. Um, and I think that that's like, don't be discouraged. Um, and with elected officials, all every elected official, every city council member, every borough president has their own set of interests. Um, and I, the more you can help align yourselves to that, um, the better. So if you look up who your council member is and they're really into food, policy and food scarcity and food deserts um, and you grow food in your garden, that is something that you should highlight when you go talk to them. Um, If it is air quality and environmental concerns are a key one for them and you uh, have a garden that helps improve its neighborhood air quality and helps uh, reduce climate change and helps stop uh, uh, rainwater runoff by collecting it, um, that is all things that you should highlight for them. Um, And your garden's relationship with elected officials are like every other relationship you have in your life. You would not call someone out of the blue and ask them to come help you move, having never talked to them before. So don't wait. And the first time that you're talking to your council member's office, be the time that you're showing up and asking for, again, our our fence, on-site water and sidewalk was a $300,000 project for the city. So don't show up and ask for $300,000 having then they don't know you. You're, you are part of your community members, your council members in your uh, want to know you. They want to know what's going on in the garden. They want to know what you're doing on their community. They want to support you. Um, it is money, money scarce, um, but it is important that you are communicating with them, that you're sharing things, what's going on with them. You should, uh, Sarah said, you should go do an introductory meeting at first. You should find out who they will have a staff member who's like assigned to your neighborhood. Um, you should find out who that is. You should add them to your like email list if they're not on it already. Um, you should invite your council member to events. Uh, anytime you have a public event, you should be inviting your council member to it so that they have a chance to come see the garden and the community that you have developed, and the local the neighborhood that you are bringing together as part of it. They need to come see it. You want to impress upon them the importance of it. Um, it's really easy to think of these things in abstract um, and the more real you can make it for them, uh, the better. Uh, and so it's a it's a relationship that you have to manage um, where you should be following up with them. You should be asking them for help. Um, if you are having trouble, say, getting your DEP hydrant permit, your council member can help you solve that. If you're having difficulty with trash pickup, they can call sanitation for you. Um, there's a lot of different things that they can do. And they, those aren't negative. They, they, they want to help. They want to know you. Um, and... Frankly, they want to be publicly thanked for doing it. So you should make sure to do that last piece along with it. Like you should acknowledge their good work and their support for you uh, for it. Um, And uh, yeah, I think those are kind of my key points. Um, And then Sarah touched on it a little bit and I'll I'll expand on it. Um, You want to be able to pitch your project 
the best way you can. And that means you want to know how many people do you serve? How many people stop at a garden? Um, what's your value? Are you bringing, are you like my Cooper Grove, mine? Um, we had a, it was a corner that was a trash lot, the city's trash lot. We made it not a trash lot. We spent a lot of time picking up trash on our corner. Um, and it was our key, one of our key pitches when we were talking to our council member was that like we had taken ownership over a piece of the neighborhood um, and we're making it nicer by organizing community members one day at a time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily about its value to us personally, but rather what we were providing to the rest of the community around us. Um, and we were providing eyes on the street, we were picking up trash, we were providing beauty and taking what was an abandoned lot and turning it into something beautiful and organized and accessible to the public um, and our neighbors. And so I think about when you think about that, start trying to pull some of that data. How many people come to your events? How many people, if you host a movie night, how many people came? You guys do sing-alongs at the local school. How many people did? Which schools? Um, all things are though. All those are all things that will help your council member understand your impact. Um, and the more regularly you are sharing that, the more visible you are. Um, there is a, a community of civic civic organizations and leaders. Your senior center, they know your senior centers because they are around, they're visible and people talk to them about them. They know your pre community precinct councils. They know block associations because they engage with them. Um, and don't let your garden um, be one of the pieces that gets overlooked because you don't talk to them about what you are doing and doing it. And I know, I know, I personally, many people get into gardening because they like to be alone. They like the quiet time. They don't want to actually have to spend, go out and talk to people. So this can be a big ask for some people whose goal of being in a garden is beautiful solitude of tending to their plants. Um, but it is important if you want to have these sort of big capital projects come your way, you have to be able to talk to, be able to, talk to your council member about what it is you are doing and the great value that you guys are all already bringing. Being gardeners and doing what you do brings a lot of value to the city. And it's not just like taking tax dollars where this sanitation isn't picking up the trash, um, but you are helping air quality. You are knitting together communities. You're providing food to people in need. Like there is a world of things that good that you do, that you know you do. Um, you just have to figure out ways to, to say it and make sure your council member is able to hear it. Um, and that means uh, engaging with them regularly, often, um, bringing them out, talking to them about your events, all those sorts of good things. Um, and I'll end there, so, say, so we have a minute for questions. Thank you, Robert. Now, all very helpful information you've provided. Um, so yes, we're opening it up to Q&A um, and reading some of the questions that you all have um, put on the chat. Um, Adder, I don't know if you have a few of them. If not, I can, uh, I can start reading some of them too on here. Hi. Uh, yes, I do have some questions. I was trying to spotlight everyone oh, and I can't okay. spotlight Sarah for some reason, but I'll work on that after I ask this question. Um, we did get a couple questions that were addressed during the presentation. So just a huge shout out to um, all of our presenters for sharing your wealth of experience and knowledge with us today. Um, one of the questions is uh, a question for Matt, a clarifying question regarding annual discretionary capital funding. Um, were you saying that community board members nominate local projects such as gardens that have done grant proposals for funding and those are voted on by CB members? Uh, okay, yeah, sorry for if I was unclear. So I think that was in the context of my description of the council's uh, participatory budgeting exercise, PB, and I made reference to PB delegates, uh, which is a separate, uh, which is in the, uh, which is conducted independently from community oh, boards. Although nothing, you know, there, there's nothing preventing a community board member from participating in as a PB delegate, or you know, so it, it's it's a separate entity. Having said that, I think along the lines of what Robert was describing about like just making sure that the you know that local electeds and local leaders are aware of the garden and all the great success work, I think the local community board can be a really helpful advocate on that front as well, making sure that they're engaged. The local, uh, most if not all, close to all uh, community boards 
have a parks like subcommittee or subcommittee. Uh, so engaging with those leaders because um, they're, you know, again, they don't necessarily assign funding per se, but they do go through an exercise where they help uh, express support for various funding priorities, you know, like in, in terms of what the city is considering, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the community board is definitely a, you know, I would argue a pretty important stakeholder in terms of the public conversation, like writ large when it comes to budgeting matters. Um, so it never hurts to have them on, you know, let be the, be aware of the successes of the garden and, you know, uh, they won't be able to provide funding in as direct a sense as, as many elected officials can, but still, I think, you know, having that drumbeat continue. Uh, but, but if I, I'm sorry if I confuse matters, they, the community board is not directly involved in, in PB or these discretionary funding aspects per se, but, you know, having them be aware and supportive of the garden is, is never a bad thing. Okay, and in the final, thank you for that. In the final minute or so that we have, I'll give the remaining two questions. The first is, um, can expense funding and discretionary funding pay for stipends to the gardeners? And there's another question about, does it matter if a project is in a New York City park, commercial property, or NYCHA location in terms of eligibility for funding? Yeah, if I don't, I'm, if I can take the second piece first, uh, yes, I mean it matters very much. I think is the short answer. Uh, the 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 ownership and jurisdiction of the of the garden is essentially kind of dictates how or it can get funded. Like that kind of sets the ground uh, groundwork, if you will, um, for how that funding can be. So, for example, for if if you are a green thumb garden, which is to say a community garden on parks property, like city property under parks jurisdiction, you have a license with Green Thumb, right? Like if you are one of our gardens, then any capital work on that site would be advanced, has to be advanced by the agency, right? Like, so even if you have a license to, with us to help care for the garden and we have an agreement with you as a garden group, that that would, you know, you would not be eligible to receive capital, only, you know, only the agency can, you know, receive capital funding to improve its property, city property. Um, so, and and if you are, if you are a garden on NYCHA property, that comes with some, I mean, not just, you know, it's an authority, not an agency. It's a sort of, a, so that's, a, that's an, you know, that's a, that's sort of an added complication there as well. Or, you know, you could be just a land trust garden that's sort of privately held. And I think you have a little more flexibility, but at the same time, I'm not sure there's quite as much availability for, for council funding to be directed towards you on the capital end. I don't think there's many mechanisms for that. So yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes, it depends uh, entirely uh, on, on that front. Uh, and then on the first uh, piece, and Sarah can probably speak to this a little bit, but if you are a you know a registered nonprofit and if you are eligible for discretionary expense funds from the council, a portion of that can certainly go towards your your staff and administrative costs. I will just say the council could speak to this better than me, but they're but when it comes to their discretionary awards, they generally expect that the awards are primarily used to provide programs and services. Like so, to the degree they pay for people. It, it has to be sort of linked to sort of specific events or initiatives or, or happenings uh, that are taking place in a garden. But, but Sarah may be able to speak to that a little, a little better. Um, I'm actually not sure how, like, so for instance, we do use a small portion to to cover some staff time, not much, you know, as Matt was saying, the, the, the lion's share really goes directly to supplies, et cetera but we do use a small portion, but I don't know, like we've, we've thought about, can we use any of that to pay any gardeners directly? But since they're not on staff with us, we can't really, you know? So I, I don't know, Robert, maybe you have found Yeah, I, I was just gonna chime in. I, like there are certainly city council expense funding that can pay for salaries. There's grant funding that pay for salaries, but I think for our purposes of this discussion, um, like if you don't know that, if your question is like, can you help pay for vo your volunteers time? Um, the answer is like, probably not really. Like it, it is a huge lift, very complicated, involves lots of layers of legal legalese and bureaucracy that like is borderline impenetrable for professional organizations. Um, so like the con if your garden isn't going to be able to apply to your council member to say, we want to be able to help pay our, our volunteers for their time, that's, that's not something that's going to work out. Um, Agreed. A little. I'm gonna say within. Oh, okay. So, just want to make sure that um, I don't know if any other panelists have anything you want to say on those questions. Um, all right. If not, I'm looking at the time. It's one of three. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us for your questions. Again, 
we're here. Um, you know, if you have any follow up questions that maybe you think about later or we just didn't get to, you can um, definitely reach out to to us, to me or, or to um, your CC. And we can help also connect you to other, you know, the people who are here and, and ask those questions as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for, to our panelists. Thank you so much for that information. I learned a lot as well. And I'm sure you all did as well who participated. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks for being here. And I hope you have a, a good day. Um, also, yeah, these these slides will be sent to you all um, after this. So you'll have the links and everything. But yeah, thank you, everyone.